Yes? Yes. 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 Um, is this anybody's first time at Porkfest? All right. Yeah. Porkfest. And do we have any libertarians in the crowd? <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure. If I was in the right place. Uh, my name is Joe Jarvis. My name is written on this poster in big letters. Um, I have a blog called Vigilant Vote at blog.vigilantvote.com. Um, I come from Massachusetts, uh, which is pretty terrible. Boo is appropriate. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, I live in Connecticut. Okay, Connecticut's not that much better. Uh, but I try to get the good guys elected down there. I uh, work for a state uh, rep who's trying to get elected state senator, very libertarian minded uh, kind of guy. So this is my second year at Port Fest. And I love it. And last year, um, when I came to Workfest, I learned a little bit about anarcho-capitalism, which I really wasn't acquainted with before. Uh, I got into the the idea of anarcho-capitalism, looked into it a lot, and I wanted to spread my idea of the benefits of anarcho-capitalism versus libertarianism, which are very related uh, but just slightly different. I hope no one minds that I decided to go low tech. Uh, I took the poster. And this isn't going to make much sense until I get going with it. But, uh, you know, my poster making skills haven't been practiced in about seven years. So I hope you don't mind the low tech aspect. So I'm not the ultimate authority on anarcho capitalism. I, uh, you know, this is built as an introduction sort of thing. Um, I just want to spread the word, basically. All right. So who wants the government to control their lives? Yeah. Nobody? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't need And really, that's what libertarianism is all about. Uh, we want the smallest government possible. What you might say, again, I don't know why I made this so small. I knew how big this room was. But uh, government, according to a lot of libertarians, is a necessary evil in order to make the trains run on time. Uh, that whole thing sort of related to Mussolini, and he was such an effective leader that he got the trains to run on time. But I think the negatives outweigh the benefits in terms of that. So that's the thing. Uh, with libertarianism, it doesn't quite go far enough. Government is the monopolization of force. It's pretty much they monopolize initiating force in a particular geographical area. I don't know if you can see the monopoly guy with a couple of Uzis up here. Yeah. That's the monopoly on force. So what that means is that the government is going to say, you have to pay your taxes, and if you don't pay your taxes, we're going to come to your house eventually, take you away with guns, and put you in jail. That's force. I can't go to my neighbor's house and do the same thing and say, well, you have to pay for protection money or I'll uh, put you in jail. That's what they call the mafia. So really, there's not much difference between the mafia and the government when you think of it from that perspective. Um, so not to offend anybody, but libertarianism sometimes it requires a little bit of double thing. Anybody familiar with 1984? Yeah. Big Brother? So, double think is the process of holding two contradictory ideas simultaneously. Two ideas that cannot coexist and be true, and holding those simultaneously. One would be the initiation of force is immoral, and the other one would be that we need a little bit of government. But if the initiation of force is immoral, then that government would be immoral as well. You can't believe that we need government and that initiation of force is bad at the same time, or that's pretty much a double thing. Uh, so what you should really think of it as, think of the government as an umpire. It's umpire down here. Uh, what happens if the umpire makes terrible calls? Probably we will get fired. So if our government makes terrible calls as that umpire, we don't have the ability to fire him. Our government's pretty much coming in here and saying, I'm going to make a bad call. I might even be working for one of these teams. I might be working for a player, but you can't fire me. That's what the initiation of, that's what the monopoly on force is about. 
We need to be able to fire the umpire when he makes bad calls. Woo. And if you can fire the umpire, they don't have that monopoly on force. They're not a government anymore. Now, we're still going to want things that resemble the government the way it is right now. Um, what do you guys want the government to do? What do you think is necessary for the government to do? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> okay, I'm done then. Justice. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the point. But a lot of people think that we need the government to have a military, to have um, police, education. There's a lot of different things that people think. Courts, right. So that is, uh, the point is that there's a market for these things. We want them. We would still want justice. We would still want courts. We don't want to be victimized. We don't want to have to be able to protect ourselves completely. Uh, we want somebody else to be able to protect us on their behalf, on our behalf. So pretty much anything that there's a market for will be taken care of in an anarcho-capitalist society. I want police. Police will spring up. But the best thing is I can fire them. The police are going to be competing. And if they don't do a good job, I'm not going to keep going to them. And if that cop beats somebody on the side of the road, he's not going to be a police officer for very long because he doesn't work for the government, which has a monopolization on force. He works for an agency, which doesn't want their cops running around beating people. So pretty much the market is going to make is going, to, is going to keep the government honest. It won't be a government because they won't have that monopoly on force. Down here uh, at the bottom of the poster is a couple of Salt uh, Park characters. I don't know if anybody watches Salt Park here. Um, but, so there's an episode of Salt Park. It's uh, season nine, episode two, actually, if anybody wants to look it up. And hippies start to take over. I don't want to offend any hippies either, but um, it, it's hippies start to take over the, the town of Salt Park. And the boys, uh, Stan and Kyle, uh, kind of hang with the hippies and figure out what they're all about. And it turns out that the hippies are, are pretty much saying that corporations are the ultimate source of evil in the world. So it starts with Stan. So it seems like we have enough people now. When do we start taking down the corporations? Hippie. Yeah, man, corporations. Right now they're raping the world for money. Kyle. Yeah, so where are they? Let's get them. Hippie. Right now, we're proving that we don't need corporations. We don't need money. This can become a commune where everybody just helps each other. Yeah, we'll have one guy who like makes bread and one guy who like looks out for other people's safety. Stan, you mean like a baker and a cop? Hippie, no, no. Can't you imagine a place where people live together and like provide services for each other in exchange for their services? Kyle, yeah, it's called a town. <laughs> Hippie, you kids just haven't been to college yet. <laughs> Um, so the idea here is that what this utopia that the hippie is trying to describe is just a town. It's just capitalism. It's just the market providing what people need. A baker, a cop. Well, that cop doesn't have to have that initiation of force. Somebody still wants him to be protecting that town. That's the capitalism side of it. You can't stop capitalism. Uh, if you support freedom, capitalism will naturally spring up. It's just the trade of goods, specializing. And the anarcho part comes in and getting rid of the monopoly on force. Get rid of the monopoly on force, all you're left with is capitalism, anarcho capitalism. There we go. But how do we get there? So, how to remove the monopoly on force? It's not something that would be easy, and it's not something that would be likely. But what I've tried to do here is just lay out a method that you can strive for in terms of getting rid of the monopoly on force, moving to an anarcho-capitalist society without upheaval. Because I know a lot of times we'll think like uh, the society will have to collapse in order for it to be rebuilt up again. This is something to strive for without having to hope for the massive violence, massive uh, upset and upheaval. So, you start with the federal government. The 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, and the Federal Reserve. You gotta get rid of them. Uh, the Constitution is great because it gave us a method for changing it. These were some of the changes that were made, unfortunately, but they can also be undone. So, the 16th Amendment was the income tax. It authorized the income tax. If you get rid of the 16th Amendment, you're defunding the federal government. 
that's a good first step, even just moving to a libertarian society. The 17th Amendment made senators elected by uh, the people of the state instead of elected by the representatives of the state government. So, fly up here, so. Um, so, senators used to be elected by the legislatures of each state. Uh, New Hampshire legislature would vote for the senators and send them down to Washington, D.C. And what that would do was give state governments representation in the federal government. Of course, the House, the other side of the federal government, was already, uh, it, it represents the people because of the, the district. So that's popular vote. But the 17th Amendment made senators elected by popular vote as well. States have no representation in the federal government. So that's a way to restore states' rights and uh, just like the competition in the market produces better businesses, competition among the states produces better states. And finally, get rid of the Federal Reserve uh, because they hold a monopoly on the money that we use. And really, by printing money, what they do is they cause inflation. Uh, if you have a savings account, it's not going to be worth as much in 10 years uh, because of the inflation. They keep printing the money. There's no more goods to be bought with the money the goods are gonna, are gonna cost more. So those are the first three steps. Then, with this power to amend the Constitution, you just make an amendment that says the government will be ended on this date. Uh, and you would wanna do this piece by piece. So you would wanna look down the road and say, we're going to end the Department of Education in 2016. That gives the free market time to fulfill the needs that the Department of Education uh, fulfilled before. Now there's already private schools. This isn't a problem. It, it would be quite easy for that to be absorbed. But then you move down the line. You get rid of the EPA. You do this one by one. And uh, different organizations are going to spring up that are like the EPA in order to keep the environment clean, but they won't have the power of force behind them. They'll have to do things mutually beneficially. Uh, they can't force somebody to clean up their land. It has to be public pressure, advocacy groups, and things like that. Finally, you're gonna get rid of the entire federal government and let the states take care of all of uh, the processes that we still think are necessary. But an uh, essential part in this is every piece of the government that you get rid of, that, that tax money needs to be rebated back to the people. Uh, not only the tax money, but it needs to be abolished for the next year. You're never gonna have to pay those taxes again. And then the federal buildings, the federal equipment, which has all been bought with tax dollars stolen from the people, needs to be auctioned off and sold back to the people. And that money needs to be rebated back into the population. What that will do is put the wealth that has been taken from us back into our hands but there's still going to be a market for those buildings. Somebody can use those buildings, somebody can use that equipment. Um, but it's not going to be by force. But the other thing is, if one of these organizations that's part of the government that we shut down wants to continue existing, that's fine. But they're going to have to come up with their own funding. So let's say the FBI thinks that they still have a, a legitimate thing to sell to people, that, that people want that protection. That's fine, but the FBI is gonna to have to come up with their own funding to buy back their equipment, to buy back their weapons, and to buy back their buildings. If they can, then it's gonna be auctioned off like everything else. Uh, but since it's a free society, there's nobody to stop them from forming their own organization and uh, trying to sell their expertise instead of forcing it on us. Then the competition among the states is gonna, uh, is gonna really be where this comes in. Do you guys know right now which states are gaining population and which states are losing it? Texas is, Texas is gaining, California's losing, um, New Hampshire, I hear you. Connecticut is losing. Connecticut's losing. I hear New Hampshire has 20,000 people moving to it. <laughs> Um, yeah. So the point is, uh, there's, a, there's actually a book out that's called How Money Walks, and it studied where 
uh, wealth was moving between the states. From 1995 to 2010, the nine states with no income tax gained $146 billion in gross domestic product from the people that live there and earn money there. And the nine states with the highest uh, income tax lost $107 billion of GDP. Uh, right there, that, that pretty much says it all. People are moving to states with lower taxes, with less government, less intrusion, less restriction, uh, fewer regulations. Where are you gonna wanna start a business? My sister wants to start a business. We live in Massachusetts. She's not gonna start in Massachusetts. She's gonna move to maybe New Hampshire, maybe Georgia, but you're not gonna start a business in a place that uh, restricts you like that. So naturally, the better states are already winning out. In the states with fewer regulations, lower taxes, the money is going from California to New Hampshire, and that's what would happen when these states are competing after the federal government is gone. And then what we would have to do is go through each of those states and go through the same process you would with the federal government. Um, set a date for ending particular programs, give the market the proper time to, to spring up with businesses that will take the places of the necessary, uh, of the necessary government functions. But the way it is right now, I don't know if you can see this picture down here, there's a guy uh, raking leaves or picking up leaves. I live in a town where they provide leaf pickup. They drive around once or twice a year and they will scoop up all the leaves at the side of the road. Um, I pay for that through my taxes. I don't have a choice to pay for that through my taxes. They decided that I'm gonna have leaf pickup and they're gonna take my money to do it. Some people don't have trees, some people don't bother breaking the leaves to the side of the road. Some people can break them into their woods. The point is, why is my money being taken and, and they're giving me a service that I can just go buy on my own? There's landscapers. Landscapers have these trucks. This doesn't need to be a government function. And I bet it would cost less too if it wasn't a government function. So that's just a small example. But, uh, but the point is that the market can easily absorb everything uh, that is necessary that the government does. All right. How's it going? You guys asleep? Woo! Oh, that's great. Um, that's pretty much the presentation I had, but as you know from the, from the billing of it, uh, this was meant to be mostly a discussion. I didn't want to sit here and talk for an hour. I wanted to get everybody's thoughts and ideas. Uh, so let's, let's talk about this more. It, can we get some questions, or there's actually a microphone up here if anybody wants to come up here and uh, we're going to talk into the microphone. I put up a site just three weeks ago, handcapfdu.com. It's just a comment of questions about how the handcaps are going to function. Yep. And basically, I wanted to throw out three or two main questions. Over time, I'd like to get some other questions answered. So, I wanted to plug that. Awesome. That's great. And uh, on my blog, blog.digitalandvote.com, there's a few different. Um, there's a bunch of different posts on this. Actually, I'm at campsite 51 and 55 up there. Uh, I'm gonna be all alone, and my family's not joining me until Wednesday. Uh, if you want to stop by, you can uh, sign up for to get emails from my blog every time there's a new post. I have a few samples with me that you can read, uh, or you can just talk about Enter the Capital. I noticed a fundamental flaw in your argument. There is a single agency I can actually think of that actually is, that basically would be against a corporation's interest to do no matter how much demand there is. And that's basically the Food and Drug Administration. Right now, they don't want people knowing what's in their food and they're obviously going to do everything they can to keep these people out. Okay, Without now. the application of force, there is no way for the people to look and see what these people are doing without 
most of the market forces would take care of this because right now what you have is the FDA serving for a blocker for bad companies that don't want people to know what's in their food. Now, you don't need force in order to get in there and do the inspecting. Um, the market forces can take care of that if if an uh, agency or just a business springs up and says, my readers want to view your factory. They want to know what's in your food and work. Maybe you want samples to take apart. If they say no, well, that's that's the market. We don't have to shop there. And being a smart consumer, it, it goes back to being a vigilant voter. If you're if the society that we have right now, we have to be uh, perfect voters in order to keep it good. In an anarcho-capitalist society, we have to be good buyers. We have to purchase from the right places in order to make that happen. But I think that the market forces would uh, take care of that better than the FDA could. I see what you're saying, but I still think the flaws there. But thank you. It's I the one, it. It really, it's it's really the biggest loophole to me. That's what the loophole is. Hi, my name is James Jenner, and uh, I produced a film called The Other Empire with Ron Paul a few years ago about the Federal Reserve System. So I work in the movie industry. And in the movie industry, we use arbiters all the time. We, all of our contracts basically say that we can submit this to the Court of Arbiters and then uh, and bypass the, the, the government judiciaries. So my question basically is this. Given the workability of arbitration, let's let's see an anarcho-capitalist society. Let's say someone, one of your neighbors, murdered someone. How would you compel the person who is believed to have murdered someone into a court of jurisdiction or arbitration without using force? Well, you would be using force. You wouldn't be initiating force. If somebody initiates force against you, responding to that force is not the same as initiating. Yeah, so who, who would be initiating force? The, you said it earlier. Well, who would be initiating force and what would motivate a partner or court or some police force to go after someone that murdered someone? So it, the motivation would be that, uh, like we all, most of us, or a lot of people have insurance, you would buy... Well, to put it bluntly, who would pay for it? The, the people who are someone's killed, I don't even know the person. Yeah. What are you going to basically pay for that? Well, you won't have to pay for it. It's either they either had insurance that would cover that in the first place. So it's a insurance through a security company because they want that crime deterrent. So you have a company that is going to go after whoever murders you. They're going to do the investigatory work just like the police would do now, and they're going to go and get that person. They're not going to be initiating force because they're, that's a murder. So they'll be brought to justice, but it, it'll be through a private company that does it, just be, just like it is now, except that you would either be paid for uh, through the insurance that you buy in the first place, or it would be paid for uh, by the family, essentially employing a bounty hunter. To so, so you're saying that everybody would have insurance in case someone was murdered? Yes. It would be murder insurance. It, it essentially would be, yeah, it would be a security company. And what if people decided they didn't want to buy that? Well, then they'd be at risk of being murdered without justice. It, 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 it is, it's, like, it's not the person that's down. murdered that wants the justice. Sorry? It's not the person that's murdered that gets a game about the justice. Well, you're right. But, so, for instance, someone in my neighborhood is killed. Yes. I don't know the person. I'm sorry they were killed, yeah. but what's going to motivate me to bring them to court? Or do you pay for insurance? Well, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have anything to do with it. If you wanted that person to be caught, then you might want to so pay for it. So if they found any friends of the victim... It, in be, reality, they would probably have already purchased security so that their security company would be going after whoever murdered them. Now, they would have the means to do this because half of their wealth that they create each year would already be taken by the government. So they have, you know, since you're not being taxed, you have this extra money, and part of what you're going to spend that on is security. You're going to buy that from an agency that offers you that service, and their thing is, we will go after a murderer, we will go after people that have committed a property crime on you, and we'll bring them to justice because you're paying us to do that. That's, that's the product. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a suggestion and a question. Yes. Uh, suggestion with uh, terminology. Uh, you're contrasting anarcho-capitalism and libertarianism.
libertarian? Yes. Um, I try to view uh, for the political spectrum as libertarian on one end, authoritarian on the other. And maybe uh, minarchism is more what you meant for for libertarianism, so that we can all be yeah, but, uh, the same big tent. Yes. But I, and I wasn't trying to end it when it's I just uh, you are right, I should use probably better terminology, but okay. <laughs> um, and the question is, so uh, I like the uh, I think you picked out the amendments and the institution that are really the, the core of the empire legally. Um, and so those are great targets. But it seems like the constitution has not been um, evolving by amendment for really like a hundred years. Yes. So uh, if you have any thoughts on that, and also if you were to try to stir up the will to get something passed, what do you think about like a right of succession amendment that clearly states that yeah. states would be as opposed to these? Right. Things? And of course, coming into uh, forming, you got to remember that the states formed the federal government, um, so it was kind of taken as a given that they didn't have to participate in it if uh, they didn't want to. Obviously, uh, the, the Civil War, not so much related to slavery, but uh, related to states' rights in terms of seceding, um, started to blow to that. But, uh, so sorry, to get back to the, the question about, the Constitution hasn't been amended in over 100 years. Um, no, it, it's been amended, but it's not the usual path. Nothing substantial. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, with the Constitution? Been, there's been alcohol and, you know, but I Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just an anti voting, voting at 18, changes in the term limits with buses. Yeah, you're right, I just spoke. I would say nothing that has changed the, the real constitutional order in 100 years since the 16th, 17th, and the Yeah, yeah, so I think that, like I said, we're feeling those would be a great place to start. Um, maybe I'm not. I mean, I'm getting confused about what you're asking. The question is, like, if, if you were going to try to get, you know, all the voters and the states together, would it be more effective to just try to pass something that said states can leave rather than repealing the federal government piece by piece? Yeah, I suppose that would be pretty effective. Um, just based on the track record, the federal government would would just probably not uh, allow that. But I guess if it was amendment, technically they would have to allow it. So that would be that would be a proper method too. Um, and you know the, the point of this is not like this is not my doctoral thesis or anything. It, it's just an idea, something to get the ball moving in that general direction. So that there's a way to think about anarcho-capitalism uh, is more than just like a fantasy. Thanks. Whatever specific path you take, you know, repealing certain amendments, get others passed, getting people elected, whatever. The real challenge is changing culture because unless people really